Folks, well, good afternoon and, and welcome to another one of our weekly test seminars. It's a real pleasure today to introduce uh, Associate Professor Karen Joyce, who is one of our colleagues here at JCU. And for anybody who's sort of tracking science at JCU, Karen's one of those people who tends to be kind of conspicuous uh, out doing things. Uh, she has that kind of entrepreneurial spirit that I really like. Uh, after getting her PhD at the University of Queensland in 2005, she then went on and did various kinds of stints, including with the Australian Army, which I thought was very interesting. She worked in New Zealand for a while, uh, and she's also founded or co-founded businesses that take, take account of her expertise in remote sensing, drones, circular economy, all these kinds of things. So I was very interested to see Karen's abstract today. It's not wasn't a typical kind of abstract we get here. It was more of a story. And it appeared like there's some real interesting messages embedded in there. So without further ado, uh, we'll turn things over to Karen. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. Um, is that mic on? Can you hear it? Doesn't sound like it. Yes, it's all right. No. It doesn't I sound right. That's up loud, but that's not one. What about now? That's on the mic now. Sweet. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for coming this afternoon. Does anyone want to come closer? You're really far away. Come to where you are. Come on, come on down. We can have a bit more like a general conversation. It's a bit more friendly that way. Right, so my, my talk might be a little bit different to what we're used to with the test seminars. It's not, the, not, a, not exactly a standard scientific presentation of the intro methods, results, discussion, conclusion, but hopefully it's thought-provoking. And if you've got questions along the way, I'm really happy to answer as well. So don't feel like you need to wait till the end. If you're like, oh, hang on, just wait there. Can we, can we look at that? Please do that. I'm really happy for that. My first question for you, and yes, I do require you to do something in my talk today. Get out your device, if you have one, and scan this code, because I've got some questions for you. If you don't have a device, that's perfectly fine. We can still play the game without it. It's not that big a deal. But if you do have your device, it's a little bit of fun to do this as well. So just once you scan that, just have a look up at me so I know where everyone's at. My question for you while we're, while we're getting the code up is to think about the way that, that you behave in your everyday life and do you consider yourself to be a minimalist or a hoarder? So how many people are familiar with, with Marie Kondo? No, Marie, yes, good one. Okay, so Marie Kondo has a, has a TV show. I don't know if it's, on, it's on Netflix or Stan or one of those ones these days. And she's very much in the in the frame of mind that you should get rid of stuff that no longer brings you joy so whether you're hoarding stuff at home whether that's you know old clothing or old electronic items or whatever it is if you don't need it anymore get rid of it and declutter your life that's her philosophy and so when we think about are we hoarders what do we do with all of our stuff or do do we get rid of our stuff that's my question for you whereabouts do you think that you sit somewhere in between those two Alrighty. So what I'm going to do is over the next couple of questions, we're going to run through what I like to think of as a little bit of a diagnostic tool. So you might have done Myers-Briggs or something like that before for personality. So this is my little test of hoarder versus minimalist. So we're going to run through a couple of scenarios. So the first one is you last night you had a wonderful dinner party, had lots of friends over at home, amazing dinner party, lots of drinks, lots of wine. But at the end of the party, there's a lot of wine bottles left over. So my question for you is what do you do with your empty wine bottles? So that should come up on your the screen that you've just put up with the QR code. So the first option is do you bury them, bury, bury them in the garden so no one can find them? Do you reuse them as vases or some other reuse? Do you keep just in case? Do you put them in the rubbish bin or do you put in the recycling? So just tap on one of those. And if you're not playing along, that's fine. Just have a think in your mind. Whereabouts do you sit in those? Okay. Are we good with that? Everyone's entered. 
All right, here we've got lots of recyclers. Good job, Tess. Nice one. And the users as well. All right, question number two. From the same dinner party, you not only have wine bottles, but you also have a number of beer bottles, maybe some beer cans as well. So same question again. What do you do with your empty bottles and cans? There's a couple of additional options on this one as well. So do you make a pile in the garden and forget about them, reuse for homebrew or any other form of reuse? Do you keep, just in case, hi, just when, when you're ready, there's a QR code up on the screen. Feel free to scan and play. Do you put them in the rubbish bin? Do you put them in the recycling? Because they're bottles and cans, do you go out and you seek the 10 cent refund that contains for change across the road? Or do you give to the kid down the street so that they can get 10 cents back? Who are you and what do you do? All right, has everyone got it? Sweet, let's see where we sit. So I wonder how much of this is with such a small group. It's a, it's a little bit, you can't quite, it's a little bit harder to make it so anonymous, right? But let's see, we do, we do have some people giving to the kid down the road so they get 10 cents. This is the reason my 12-year-old is seriously rich because so many people give him bottles and cans. He doesn't even do anything for them. But lots of people are really happy to do that. All right. Interesting. Okay, let's up it up just a little bit. So something that's worth a, perhaps a little bit more value to us, an old pair of jeans or an item that you used to love but no longer brings you joy. Perhaps you have grown out of them, you're too fat, too thin, too tall, too, too short, the wrong fashion, whatever it is. This pair of jeans was yours. What do you do with it? Do you vacuum pack and store in the garage? Do you make into funky denim cocktail napkins for your next cocktail party or do you reuse in some way? Do you keep at the bottom of the wardrobe just in case? Rubbish bin, friends, family, op shop, or are you the seller on eBay kind of person? Who are you? What do you do? You good? Let's see if the financial return makes any difference as to how we behave with our jeans compared to our bottles and cans. Lots of op shoppers, good stuff. Anyone selling on eBay? Not yet. Okay, and we've got some just in cases and rubbish bins. Okay, cool. All right, now let's bring this around to something that we might not have considered in the same way before. Your data. And when I say your data, I don't mean your personal data, but personal in the sense of this is stuff that you've gone out and collected. Perhaps it's it's a forest survey or it's, for me, drone imagery or something like that, some, some form of data that you've captured as a scientist. What do you do? Do you leave in the bottom drawer and forget about it? Do you reuse for a blog or some other purpose? Do you store on a hard drive or server just in case, nature paper, next project, maybe something is going to happen with this. Do you delete it? Do you put it in an online open repository for others to use? Or do you sit there and hope that someone is going to buy it from you? What do you want to do? Got it. All right, let's see if we change our minds of this type of behaviour. Yes, we have lots of hoarders here. Storing on hard drives. Good, we've got some people adding to online repositories. Got some bottom drawers. Deleters, my goodness. Interesting when I run this for government and get what the answers you get there as well. And if anyone goes delete, everyone freaks out. All right. So what I want to talk about today is really thinking about some of these attitudes and, and how we might change our mind and think about our data in different ways, thinking about what we spoke about with the bottles of wine, the bottles and cans, and our genes, for example, and how that relates to a linear versus a circular economy. So a linear economy is where, where we extract or manufacture something, we use it, and then we dispose of it. And we probably all know some products that we do that we behave in that way with in that linear economy. But then I can see from the answers here that a lot of people are actually trying to behave more in a circular economy where we're really trying to keep those products and materials in use for as long as possible before they can become terminal. What I'm interested in is how can we do that with our data and how does that benefit us as society and scientists as well? So I'm going to take a step back from this 
and tell you a story. And as I move into this, I still want you to keep it in your mind, are you a hoarder or a minimalist? And what did that little survey show? So if you answered one to three more frequently, you're probably a hoarder. And that was pretty, that's pretty much showed what we showed up with as a group. There's a couple of different types of hoarders. We have our out of sight, out of mind hoarders, our purposeful hoarders. You're going to hoard for a particular reason and the just in case hoarders. And then we have our minimalists who delete, they share, or maybe they want to make some cash or some other benefit out of what, whatever it is that they have. So I want to explore a little bit about how you can be not necessarily one or the other, but how you might be able to be both and how you might be one or the other in different circumstances. All right, so stepping back and giving you a bit more of a personal story and how this comes to play in my work. Great Barrier Reef. Anyone know how many reefs we have on the GBR? I just do. <laughs> yeah, how many have we got? 2,500. Yeah, somewhere around about that. All right, somewhere around two and a half to 3,000 or so across an area that is the equivalent of Victoria plus Tasmania. Okay. My main research interest, and it has been for about 25 years now, is trying to figure out how much live coral we have on the Great Barrier Reef because we actually don't know the answer to that question. And sometimes we think, well, we should know the answer, right? And we, we talk about is the Great Barrier Reef expanding or dying? Should it be in danger? What's, what's happening with bleaching, all these things? And when we don't actually know how much live coal we have in the first place, these are really, really hard numbers to come at. But when we think the Great Barrier Reef is the size of Victoria plus Tasmania, do we know all the live plants in those states, let alone thinking about the heterogeneity on a reef? It's a really, really challenging question. So part of my work is trying to figure out how do we answer this question? I'm going to take you all the way down to the Southern Great Barrier Reef. This is the Capricorn Bunker Groups just off the coast of Gladstone and pointing there to Heron Reef. So if we look at Heron, it sort of looks a bit like an upside down dead rat. Got it? Can you see that? The eye of the rat is the island. The island is 800 metres long, so two laps around an athletics field. The reef itself, the full extent, is about 11 kilometres east-west and four kilometres north-south. So the island really, really little. The reef relatively large, one of 3,000 or so, okay? Now I'm going to zoom all the way into this particular area and show you the highest resolution commercially available satellite data in a moment. But before I get to that, I'll ask you the question. Can you tell me how much live coral we have there? No. Neither can I after 25 years of looking at this image, right? So zoom in. Let's go to something like what you might see on Google Earth. Can you tell me how much live coral we have there? That's some dark words. Are they rocks, corals, algae? I don't know. That's not just, oh, if you've got a trained eye, you can give the answer to that question. No, you cannot answer that question with a satellite image. And so that's why I use drones. So can you see there where the live coral is? So if you haven't looked at drone imagery of corals before, the, the live parts are sort of the more browny bits around the edge of each of those patches. The dead coral is on the top, and that doesn't mean to say it's not healthy because a lot of coral is dead on top. It grows out like this. So all the brownie bits you see there are all the live coral. So this is what I work with and I really enjoy looking at. I just might just turn the – can I turn the front lights out? Does that – it's not a problem for zooms? Okay. Um, is that a little bit better? Is that help? Cool. All right, so this is what it looks like underwater. So can you see the live coral there? Yeah, most of that is alive. You can see the dead bits on top. And so you might argue, well, I can definitely see the live coral there, right? There's no problem with that. I don't have any issues. Ripples at the water surface. So why don't we just do everything underwater? And it would be a fair question. But this is one of the challenges that we have. So what you'll see here is this is one of my colleagues. He's got a bar 
And on that bar, there are three GoPros and they're looking down and taking photos as he goes. There's, you'll see an orange a little bit on him. That's, a, that's just a boy with a GPS on it so we can track where he is. I'm droning not directly above him. I am droning off to the side, but above him. And shortly you'll see just there we have his buddy has popped into view as well. So what I want you to appreciate from this video is how tiny he is. And as we're panning back, we're on Heron Reef, just what we saw the satellite image before, and I'm not a videographer, hence the clunkiness of this video, but you'll pan back all the way to see the island in a moment. So he's teeny, teeny, tiny, trying to figure out how much coral there is on his little transect, but there's no way as one person in the water, you can do that over all of Heron, let alone times 3,000, right? So that's just not an option to do everything in water. And I guess, you know, with your own studies out in the field as well, you're a teeny tiny person. How do we scale up to bigger areas? And so one of the things that we then do is think about, well, we've got people in the water. We know satellites don't give us the, the detail that we need. So where do drones fit in here? And so this is, this is me on the beach at Heron as well. And so I do this quite frequently to map areas that I'm interested in. But I still feel kind of small, right? So there's only a certain area that I can cover as well. And so if I think, well, how do I, how do I actually try to figure out how much live coral we have on the Great Barrier Reef? In addition to looking at a range of other environmental challenges globally, how do we actually get at this? And the answer, of course, is to talk to other people because there are other me's out there doing drone mapping in environments that they're really interested about. So on the bottom left, we have got Professor Gillen over in Arizona. He's interested in savannah ecosystems and recovery after fire. We've got Andrea and her team on the top right, and she's interested in glacier movement and how that's changing with climate change. And we've got some rangers up at Archer Point, just south of Cooktown, who are mapping their coastline and their sea country as well. So we've got people all over the world who are doing all these really cool little things in their little areas. But then how do we think, well, if everyone's doing these little bits and pieces, how can we learn from other aspects of our life and actually get a better picture of what's going on globally as well? Because this is what we're all doing. We've all got our data that we are holding and holding to ourselves, just like I did with this, the little quiz with you earlier, looking at hoarders versus minimalists. So everybody is effectively hoarding to themselves where the chances of us actually making greater scientific discoveries and working towards a more sustainable future for the planet is actually if we open a lot of this stuff up. But this is what we have at the moment. We've got hard drives, we have SD cards, we have servers, all these things where data is, is stored effectively locally for individual researchers. So when I started to think, well, how do I map the Great Barrier Reef in addition to thinking about are there other areas around the world where this would be useful, I started to think about, well, how is it done in other areas? Because we do map globally already. And one of my biggest inspirations is Landsat. So Landsat series of satellites has been orbiting since the 1970s. There's global repositories of data that was made open in 2008 thanks to President Obama. And he decided to open the whole archive of Landsat data and it has stayed open for all these years and always will be as well. And what he did in enabling that was actually unlock a $17 billion geospatial industry that wasn't there before. So I find this really, really fascinating. By making something free, you can unlock a multi-billion dollar industry. So I'm really fascinated with that. And, I, and then when I come back to drones, I think, well, the cool thing about drones is that every single one of you could have a drone and you could all be going out collecting data. There's a couple of Landsats and then a couple of other satellites from other providers as well, but there's not really that many. But there's actually hundreds of thousands of people with drones around the world. So how do you make a distributed system where we can actually all come together with the same sort of mentality as like what we have with Landsat? 
And so this takes me back to my questions of hoarder versus minimalist and asking you about your bottles and cans and how you behave in terms of recycling and reusing because actually we do recycle and reuse pretty well now. We didn't, that it was not like long ago that that was an unusual thing to do. It's now not an unusual thing to get some money back for your materials and your products or to go, you know what, I don't care about the money. I'm going to give it to the kid down the road. Just, just get out of my way, you know, and then we can continue to build that circular economy. So how do we bring all of these concepts together and go, okay, actually we have aspects of a circular economy in one part of our life where this is a really normal thing for us to do now, but then we have other parts where we lock stuff up. How do we bring them together? And that's something that I'm really, really fascinated in. So I want to give you another example in my work about how these two things can actually relate and relate really well. So this image up here, this is also from Heron Reef. So say I'm an, say I'm an entrepreneurial kind of person and I think actually this image, it actually it cost me a couple of thousand dollars to capture this image by the time I got out to the field, all my equipment, took this photo, all this stuff. So it cost me a lot of money. I want some money back in return for this particular photo. How much would you pay me for this photo? Anybody pay me any money? Probably not, right? Like nobody's actually going to pay you for one single bottle or can, right? That was never the way it worked. The value is when everything is all together. But so the interesting thing about this particular photo are these things. Anyone know what they are? Sea cucumbers, yeah. So sea cucumbers are actually a really big fishery for Australia that we push across to Asia. So when I captured this photo, I knew there were sea cucumbers out on the reef. I've never really done anything with them, but I put it up on social media. I didn't try to get money for this photo. Put it up on social media, I said, hey, anyone out there studying sea cucumbers? I can count them in drone imagery. Does anyone want to collaborate on something? These are what these critters look like in the water. If you haven't seen one before, there's lots of different species. They're really quite cool, but definitely not as charismatic as many other marine species, so they don't get too much attention. Close up, one of the reasons that we're particularly interested in, in them for the Great Barrier Reef is because their poo is cleaner than what they eat. So they're effectively hoovers for the sediment on the reef. They clean it all out, poop it out nice and clean. So if you have put your toes in the sand, in an area where there's sea cucumbers, you've been walking in poop. They are a real, they perform a really, really cool ecosystem service. And they do look kind of cool when you see them out and about eating and moving as well. So these are sea cucumbers, and that's one of the reasons why that particular photo was of interest to me and to my colleagues, who my now colleagues that I didn't know before, but reached out to me after I posted on Twitter and said, hey, yeah, let's let's do something fun with this. So after that post went up, went up on Twitter um, a couple of years ago now, it has led to many, many different things. So the first one was 25 minor student projects, thanks to our advanced GIS class that we run down in Townsville. One master's project, two PhD students, two peer-reviewed articles, more than $150,000 in advertising space equivalent. So what this is, is that any time your work gets out in the media, we get a JCU media report back to, and says, hey, if we'd actually paid for advertising, this is how much it's worth. So actually see cucumbers and particularly when you say poo in common media, this actually does really, really well. So quite a bit of money in advertising space equivalent for JCU. A global citizen science engagement where we have people counting sea cucumbers in drone imagery all over the world. And the big ticket item, thank you for nobody wanting to buy my photo off me. We've had more than a million dollars worth of funding that has come out of that photo. And my largest funding project is for sea cucumbers. I actually know nothing about sea cucumbers. All I do is drone map, yeah? But all this came about because I didn't hoard that photo. I didn't try to get money for it. I had the mentality of how could I reuse this? How could I collaborate with others? Which I think is kind of fun. And I got some really cool relationships out of that as well. So this brings me to the circular drone data economy, which was the title of my talk. So we know what a circular economy is out in our everyday life in terms of bottles and cans and all that sort of thing. But what does that look like when we think about drone data or any data for that matter? It could be applied to any area that, you're, that you work in. It's just that I'm interested in the drone side of things. 
So first of all, we capture data. We have a place where people contribute those data into where it's curated, and then people can create on top of that and enables people to collaborate together. And once you do that, then you start identifying, okay, where are more places where we need to catch up? And we continue to fulfill that cycle. And the more we do that, the more we get out of that as well as we build. So I want to sh share with you a couple of challenges and the way we've approached dealing with them as we've gone through this. So the first one is that when I, when I first started saying, okay, I really think we should put data out there and enable people to use it, firstly, to solve my own problem of being really lazy and when people wanted my data, it was a real hassle for me to sift through all my folders and go, oh, maybe this one will suit them, maybe this one. And, you know, I just kind of wanted to be a bit lazy and just go, hey, you know what, you do it for yourself. Here it is, you go. And I realised there are other people like that as well. They've got all this data and they go, yeah, I want to share it. But you know what? It's too hard. It's just, it is just way too hard. It's not like if you want to share your videos, you go to YouTube, you want to share maybe pretty pictures, you might go to Unsplash. What do we do for drone data? So we built a, a repository where people can upload their drone data and share it with people around the world. And as of now, we have data in 68 countries around the world and more than 700,000 drone mapping images. And you can go online and, and have a look at all the, all the different places where there's drone mapping data in so many different ecosystems. The next part of it was that through working with a lot of the, a lot of the traditional owners and school groups in particular, I realised that when we capture drone data, or any data, right, you know there's always this processing overhead and it's not that easy to do. And drone data requires you to have beefy computer systems, software, licenses, and the expertise to process all these data. So I thought, well, what if we just we don't just have a platform where people just dump their stuff and, you know, have at it if you like, but what if we actually process data for them? So all they have to do is fly the drone and then upload the data. So we built a processing engine where basically you upload your raw data, it's processed into what's called an author mosaic or everything stitched together. This is out at Trinity Park. And also the additional products that we create are digital elevation models. So here you can see sort of the tops of trees, tops of houses, and then we get rid of all the trees and houses into the digital terrain model as well. So all those products are then available for the people who upload the data, but also anyone else that wants to use that as well. Then once we started with that, the next challenge, there's always there's always something more, right? The next one came back, it's like, this is really cool and I want to work with this, but you know what? GIS is so hard. How many people have felt that? There's just always something else you're like, oh, my God, do I have to seriously do 12 clicks to set up a feature class so that I can start digitising a new polygon? So why do we make it that difficult? There is no need for that whatsoever. So we started to think, okay, what are the, all the pain points in basic digitizing to start with? What are all those pain points that, you know what, we could actually design better. We don't have to do it like that. There is no reason to do it like that except for Esri says so. So built a, a platform or a part of the platform or the tools to be able to really super easily digitize just with two clicks instead of 12 you've done any digitizing you know that you want to reduce the number of clicks as much as possible and to be able to freehand draw around things instead of clicking 500 million times it's actually not that hard to do and why do the commercial packages not do this so the next challenge then was okay people are coming on and they're saying here's my data set I want to share my data but actually what we really want to share is our mapping insights. So we want to bring people in and just like what we might do with Google Docs and people are all in together and collaborating real time, you know what, we want to do that on our map too. So that's the next step. So you can invite people into your map. So create your map, upload your drone data, process your drone data, start making all your beautiful annotations to say what's where, and then go, hey, come and join me. And then people can come in, they can comment on your work and start editing things as well. You can have a truly collaborative experience, which is a huge amount of fun to build, but really challenging, lots of fun. And then the next one, and my last one for the moment, although there's many, many more to come, but the one that we're working on at the moment is, 
how, how do we recognise that we now have more than 700,000 drone mapping images that we know are so much more detailed than satellite data? What next? How do we use those to better calibrate and validate our global satellite models? So to talk through that, I'm going to share a very specific example of where the differences are and how we can actually use the data that we have. So I'm not sure if anyone would have heard of the Allen Coral Atlas here before. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, cool. So it's a, it's a global database, I guess, if you like, of, of different habitat classes on, on global coral reefs. It's amazing. It covers the whole world. It's the, it's the first the first continuous map of all the reefs of the world and a huge amount of work went into to creating this. It's all freely available as well. So you can jump online and have a look at this one. Let's have a look at how it performs in our local area. So Cairns, so we're somewhere up around here. And I'm gonna come into this reef here. I'm gonna zoom all the way in to have a look at what we see. So this is Hastings Reef. Has anyone been at Phoenix Hastings? Really, really beautiful if you get the opportunity to go out there. So this is what it looks like from the satellite. This is what the Allen Coral Atlas will tell us is there. So you can see this sandy sort of colour is sand. So we want to go in a little bit closer into this area here and see what we see. Okay, this is what satellite tells us that we see. You think it looks like sand? Maybe. That's what the classification tells us that it is. And again, if you're not used to looking at marine type data, think about how this might apply to some terrestrial land cover classification as well, right? Same sort of thing it'll look like. Lots and lots of sand. But see, the thing is, when we look at the drone data, this is what it looks like. It's not just straight sand. And if we want to zoom all the way in, we actually have really, really complex habitats. So we do have lots and lots of live coral, with some beautiful sea stars on sand, yes. Uh, we've got some fish, we've got some rays, some clams, and here are our sea cucumbers. But none of that is captured when you map at a global scale and you say this is sand. And then what happens is if people are then making decisions further down the line, which they do in terms of, yeah, we've lost this much coral cover or we should have these species in these types of habitats, if that baseline global underlying mapping is wrong, then all of our predictions are flat out wrong which is a really, really serious issue, particularly when we start thinking about climate change and some of the, some of the interventions that we may want to make. So I'm going to jump in and I'm actually going to talk about these clams next because the reason that we actually found these two clams was thanks to some work that we've been doing on Orpheus. How many people have been out to Orpheus? If you get the chance, go to the JCU research station there. It is absolutely magnificent. But there are these areas that it was it was made as a as a clam fishery, clam aquaculture patch, I guess, many years ago. And as so, what's happened is there are all these giant clams that are squashed all in together. But it, because there's so many of them, it makes them perfect to train artificial intelligence models. So we've been training a model. One of my one of my master students have been training a model to be able to detect clams. And then use the global repository to go, hey, this is what a clam looks like. Where else are they? And that's how we found them in the previous image because the model was telling us that, which is super cool. Also being able to tell purely because we have all of these data together based on another project that we're working on is looking at how the islands of the Great Barrier Reef change over time. So what you're looking at here is not a digitizing error, not a georeferencing error, but an island or a small K off the coast of Townsville, five weeks apart. And this is how much it changes. A 40 meter shift. And this is about a three meter high little K as well. So this is just amazing information that you can get from drone data that you wouldn't get from satellite data either, not just because the spatial detail is not there, but because it doesn't capture, de capture data over these areas that frequently. This is part of another project with some students in Townsville as well. 
Another fun thing that we're able to do because we have this platform that we can get everyone to work on is every year we run a competition getting school kids to map their school with the idea of trying to help them understand how much green tree shade they have as a percentage of their school campus and what can they do about it? Do they want to make any change? We have some really cool stories. These, these kids on the left realised how low their tree shade coverage was on their, on their school campus and actually petitioned their, their PNC or their, their school board to put more shade on, on their school campus as well. So it's a really fun project that kids do. And we've got primary school kids on the right-hand side there as well with their certificates of being the, these are the ACT winners on the right-hand side. And with, this is all possible when we have everything all together in one place and a really fun place to map together. So back to my original question is how do we map the Great Barrier Reef and all the live coral that's there? And as I said, I'm kind of small, but what you can see now is up on the, all the dots there on the map are all the current Great Barrier Reef data sets that we have on the platform. And actually this hasn't even been done as a collaboration with the organizations that you see their logos on the right. These are just organisations that go out and they map the Great Barrier Reef and they've just put their data there. I haven't even had to ask them. I haven't had to write up a research proposal to say, hey, let's, let's all work together, let's do this. Just provide the place and they can come and they can do this and then they can get the benefits out of that collectively as well. So just to close off, I really like this quote from Sir David Attenborough. If working apart, we're a force powerful enough to destabilise our planet. Surely, working together, we're powerful enough to save it. Thanks for coming.